to talk about um, brain networks in, uh, in uh, neuroscience, we have to define why the notion of networks is important and how we came up with, uh, with that uh, new concept. And basically, we have to look back at the revolution of uh, looking at brain activity and brain function with brain imaging or techniques over the past 20, 25 years. And this, this, these modalities, these uh, methods, basically, have uh, been very good at um, informing us about what brain regions are uh, present, if you will, or are activated when someone is, you know, producing language or uh, listening to speech sounds or uh, using working memory or uh, looking at faces or anyways. So what, what these techniques have been showing us is basically a mosaic of uh, regions in the brain that supposedly are necessary uh, in a certain function, in a certain role. And, you know, this uh, we have uh, inherited from this long tradition of anatomists who have um, basically mapped the brain with surgical tools um, to basically isolate uh, a certain portion of the brain as if it were responsible for a certain function. So there has been this tradition of assigning one function to one brain region. Uh, one very good example of that is uh, Broca's region, which is a, a little portion of the inferior frontal lobe, especially on the left side, which uh, in uh, some patients can be impaired by a brain lesion and has to be removed by the surgeon. And this is how Broca basically uh, gave his name to that uh, small region. And in these patients, what happens is that when the, this, uh, this region is uh, impaired or is absent, then language functions is also impaired. So, and that's only one, one of the many examples that basically we have learned from surgical approaches to understand brain function. And interestingly, this has, uh, you know, continued uh, through the revolution of brain mapping uh, using brain imaging techniques and until, uh, you know, um, recently where uh, basically we realized that, okay, this approach is really not satisfying. And you see uh, in many different uh, experimental settings, probing different brain functions, you know, the same brain regions being activated. And also there is this realization that, of course, anatomically, everything is pretty much connected to everything uh, in the brain through the, these long highways of communication uh, made of uh, axon, ax axons and white fibers. So anatomically, the brain is, a, is certainly a network, and therefore we need to resort to maybe new tools and new concepts to basically understand better uh, brain function. So this has been definitely a revolution over the past, I would say, five plus years in, uh, in neuroscience and in brain mapping in particular. So we are looking at... Um, this already complex uh, system and complex object, anatomically and physiologically speaking. But uh, we are now uh, in uh, the necessity of you resorting to also more sophisticated tools to basically, um, you know, extract uh, the necessary uh, information from the data we capture with brain imaging. Um, so if I can explain in a little bit more details, for instance, uh, the different approaches, um, basically the, uh, what happens is that we are looking at anatomically at um, this uh, organization of the brain as uh, regions that are, you know, at different scales, basically, reveal um, a, a certain hierarchy of connectivity. So there is this notion of connectivity of the functional con connectome of the brain that has uh, developed over the past few years. And when you look at cells with a microscope, they are really the neuronal cells of the brain and others, um, other, other types of cells, they are tightly interconnected and they form little assemblies of neurons that are usually when one is active, it's very likely that the other one, the other neighbors are very active also. And in that respect, they form a, net, a small network. But if you step back a little bit and you look at a different scale, then this kind of organization uh, remains. And fundamentally, when you start to study uh, the architecture of brain 
interconnections using, for instance, diffusion-weighted MRI, what you see is and what you see are you know tightly interconnected uh, regions, but not in a random manner. Obviously, evolution uh, has basically made this organization very. Um, with, I mean, has provided uh, this organization with a beautiful and very efficient architecture. So what, what we learn from the anatomy, what we see in the anatomy of, uh, of uh, the interconnections of the brain is that um, basically there are these huge, uh, these massive highways of communication through the, uh, the axonal bundles, the white fiber uh, underneath the, the cortical uh, mantle, the gray matter. And um, if you uh, look at how, how one brain region is interconnected with another one uh, that you randomly select, well, everything is connected to everything in the brain, but usually with a one to two to three maybe uh, uh, steps uh, and intermediate steps of communication, and which makes the, um, the brain look like a small world kind of um, universe. So this notion of small world interconnection and network uh, was actually developed not in brain science, but in sociology, where there, there was this famous experiment back in the 1960s, uh, where you can demonstrate that uh, everyone is, in, is interconnected with anyone else in a society with a maximum degree of, with at maximum six degrees of interconnection. So I could um, basically um, uh, get in touch with, for instance, uh, the president with, uh, by resorting to my closed uh, uh, social network and f little by little um, and uh, exploring this network of social interactions, I would reach to any particular person uh, in the world, including the president uh, uh, of Russia, for instance. Um, so. This uh, has been these techniques, the mathematic, mathematical techniques to explain uh, uh, the, the properties of a given network, given its uh, architecture, uh, were translated into what mathematicians have called uh, graph theory. So it's, a, it's an entire subfield of mathematics that basically, you know, develop the tools and the notions and the and the formal concepts to basically. Uh, apply measures uh, on networks. So certain network architectures are more efficient than others uh, in terms of uh, uh, broadcasting information from one point to any other point in the network. Some others are more efficient in terms of resilience to attacks or to uh, um, insults to the architecture. And that's very pertinent to brain, to the brain, of course, because the brain processes information and to process information, different brain regions need to work together. And this is how the brain is wired. And um, for that to properly evaluate and test hypotheses, scientific hypotheses about brain communication, we need to have the proper tools to work on experimental data. So we have now, since the past five to 10 years, uh, absorbed some of these uh, you know, uh, applied aspects of uh, graph theory uh, to basically apply new measures on, on brain maps. So instead of looking at very static maps of um, you know, brain regions that light up uh, when the subject is performing a language task versus a visual task, then we are looking at integrated measures uh, of uh, collaboration, so to speak, in the brain, uh, inspired by these uh, mathematical tools. So the, the concept of the human connectome is, uh, has been uh, you know, emerging, and it's an entire new field of uh, uh, integrative neuroscience, uh, which makes it very um, exciting for the next few years ahead of us, because this is really, uh, we realize that it's, it's how basically the brain works, uh, and this is how we should now uh, consider um, basically a science of an integrative and multidisciplinary science of, uh, of um, brain function uh, by looking at how brain anatomy enables brain function and how brain function may also shape some aspects of uh, brain development, in including in how uh, the, the different brain regions are wired. 
And it's also very uh, pertinent to look at it uh, in um, clinical or preclinical neuroscience as well, because more and more uh, brain disorders are, you know, um, approached and studied um, with a network science kind of um, perspective. For instance, a, a great example of that is uh, concerns the psychiatric disorders and mental health uh, issues where basically you scan someone who is affected with schizophrenia or major depression um, and you don't see very clear or if any uh, you know, um, disparity or differences with a healthy brain, anatomically speaking, but also if you do brain functional uh, imaging uh, on these persons, you don't see very clear differences. However, uh, if you look at it from a brain network perspective, um, and use these new tools and emerging tool of, uh, of um, functional connectivity. Uh, there are studies that report that actually the differences are more in how the brain uh, is interconnected in these syndromes. The new tools of brain network analysis have revealed that, uh, I mean, some very pertinent and very significant changes in the wiring, if you will, and even the integrative functions of this, uh, of this patient's brain that were, could not be seen at the anatomical level or just the basic mapping level of brain activity. So um, this is definitely a new dimension in uh, how we look at the brain and how we study the brain and how we use the techniques to basically analyze um, experimental data from, from healthy controls but also patients. So now the question is, okay, what are the mechanisms that uh, basically enable uh, the, uh, you know, the communication in the brain or miscommunication in the case of uh, clinical studies? And this is very much an open question um, these days because it's a complex one. Uh, like I said at the beginning, um, we have to look at things at different scales and understand how you know, cells communicate with one another at a smaller scale and how this basically pass through the different scales of uh, neural assemblies, regional brain activity, and then inter-regional uh, functional connectivity at the whole brain scale. And so this is a very, very active field of, uh, of research in neuroscience uh, these days. And it's a complex one because we need to have access to a reasonable, you know, uh, spatial resolution uh, so that we can assess functional connectivity at the global uh, uh, level. So we need to have full coverage of the brain and not only a few electrodes, you know, for instance, implanted in, um, in the brain to see what's happening at a very small unit, at a very small scale. So, and we need also millisecond temporal resolution, which is really the natural speed of the brain, so that we can, we can really um, elaborate models and test these models with experimental data to understand how basically functional connectivity emerges uh, in brain networks. So um, one remarkable thing is that, uh, you know, when electrophysiology was pretty much invented and, uh, and developed back, back in uh, the late 19th century and early uh, 20th century, what uh, scientists basically measured in the first place were brain oscillations or brain rhythms. And um, these oscillations are, you know, everywhere in the brain. This is a natural uh, property that emerges from cell assemblies at different scales. So that makes it a very interesting marker. Like I was saying before, we need to have a marker of brain activity that can be accessed and uh, can be pertinent at different scales from cell assemblies to the whole brain. So in that respect, oscillations uh, uh, really address this kind of, uh, of challenge. And now one entire field of research is looking at uh, the possibility of how, or how these oscillations could enable brain communication and neural communication, especially at long distances. So um, the brain basically generates these rhythms from you know, very slow oscillations, sometimes one cycle per a few seconds, if not more, to very fast uh, in the range of uh, you know, one cycle per millisecond, sometimes at the maximum. So 
this is a real range. It's like a repertoire of uh, different rhythms and that can enable different aspects of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, synchronization between the brain regions at different scales again. So one very active field of research in, in brain imaging and neuroscience these days with time-resolved techniques is to basically understand how these different frequencies and brain rhythms basically coexist and can be coupled and decoupled very dynamically as the brain is resting or resolving a, a certain problem, performing a certain task relating to behavior and also brain function and dysfunction. So um, these aspects of brain synchrony are is really, or, or oscillatory synchronies in different ways is really um, a very is a very promising uh, subfield of uh, neuroscience these days to look at brain networks indeed